Hola. Good afternoon, good evening, buenas noches. This is Abelardo de la Peña Jr. with La Plaza de Cultura y Artes, Director of Marketing and Communications, bringing you to tonight's edition of En Casa con la Plaza, our virtual programming, which has been on the air on uh, Zoom and Facebook Live since April of 2020 due to the pandemic. Uh, and um, you know the lockdown and staying home, keeping safe. Three or more times per week, we've been bringing you the best of our community's history, art and culture from our home to yours via these presentations, conversations, demonstrations, and performances. Uh, if you joined us on Zoom, please uh, let us know where you're viewing from. I'll put it right there in the chat. Uh, use the Q&A questions. We'll be taking questions, probably saving them till the end of the presentation. If you've joined us on Facebook, welcome, bienvenidos. Use the comments section to let us know where you're viewing from, ask questions, make comments, let us uh, start a watch party. Remember that feature is going away April 16th, so get it while you can. Uh, we're gonna be touching on a subject, which is, uh, again, it's it's a, a current event, a current, his, La Plaza, we touch on history, art and culture. This touches on history and culture, talking about the Asian community in Los Angeles. As you know, El Pueblo, where we're located at, is home of, of uh, all of our communities, immigrants that came together, the Italians, the, the, the Chinese, uh, Los Mexicanos, and more. And to talk to us about the history of the Chinese, of the Asian community, excuse me, here in Los Angeles is our guest for tonight, Jeff Yang, a veteran strategy and communications professional whose career in media, marketing, and technology has spanned three decades. He just sent me his most recent, I knew him back in the day when it was only two decades, but now it's, it's three. He's been uh, uh, working with successful media and marketing startups, a founder of A Magazine, Inside Asian America, which grew into Asian America's largest and most influential English language media institution, and A Online, one of the first Asian American content and community sites on the web. He writes frequently for CNN. He's a columnist for the Wall Street Journal Online, can be heard on radio as a contributor to PRI, WNYC, recently, All Things Considered. Um, he has a podcast. He wrote Jackie Chan's best-selling autobiography called I Am Jackie Chan. Is the editor of three graphic novels and one coming up real soon, which we'll be talking about. And, uh, and last, he's a Latter-day convert of Los Angeles. Uh, recent, arrival, relatively recent arrival to LA from other parts. But uh, with that, let's bring up Jeff Yang. Come on in, Jan. Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Avalardo, for inviting me to this and for just uh, really curating this conversation so brilliantly. I, I've uh, gone back and, and listened to and seen some of the things you've done. I know that you've had some of our friends on. And uh, it, I mean, it gets real and it gets wild. I like that. <laughs> well, that's the way we do it uh, at, at La Plaza de Cultura y Artes. We're a young institution. We're just going on our 10th year ourselves, even though the, the history of, uh, of Latino, Latinas, uh, Latinx here in, in the community has been since its founding. But, um, but again, we're part of a larger community and that's what we want to talk about tonight. Mm. Uh, so being a recent, uh, tell us a little bit about what brought you to LA. <laughs> it's uh, it's kind of an unusual reason. I, I could say it's for career reasons, but not my career. <laughs> I uh, I actually first uh, moved out here uh, seven years ago now, because my son, uh, my elder son Hudson Yang, got cast in a television show, and it, it was kind of an out of the blue thing. He basically announced when we we're living back in New York City, you know, as kids do, that he wanted to be on TV. And after I stopped laughing, <laughs> I said, well, look, you understand it's incredibly hard to do this. And most people who try it fail. And especially if you happen to be, you know, looking like this, your opportunity is not going to be knocking at your door. Uh, but if you want to try it, I'll take you to an audition. I took him to one. There was this uh, television show that was looking for a bunch of Asian kids, like three Asian boys. And uh, just, you know, basically history was accidentally made and he got cast as the uh, eldest uh, of three boys in Fresh Off the Boat, 
the ABC television series that went for six seasons and uh, 116 episodes, uh, focusing for the first time in 20 years on an Asian American family. And yes, that also forced us to move out here. <laughs> but blissfully, we love it here. <laughs> well, that, that's good to hear, Jeff. And, and we're glad to have you here because you've been, uh, of course, touching on Asian, a Asian American uh, topics uh, through your books, through your uh, uh, commentary uh, online and, and uh, in print and, and, and helping out companies uh, to understand uh, that community even more. So, uh, but we're gonna dig deep into what you've learned just in these few short years that you've been in LA about, uh, about Chinese, about Asian history in, in LA. So why don't you go ahead and, and tell us what you've learned. Uh, again, if you have questions and comments out there, throw them up to us and, uh, and we'll take them during the conversation or, or afterwards, but uh, go for it, Jeff. Sure thing. I mean, the first thing is uh, coming from New York to LA is one of the hardest cultural and psychological shifts you can possibly imagine, right? Uh, throw in all the jokes about, you know, stereotypical uh, Asian drivers you want to throw in, <laughs> but I'm from, the, I'm from a place where I, I take the subway and uh, here I was in Los Angeles having to con confront highways and uh, 45 minute drives to literally everywhere. So, uh, <laughs> I mean, including like around the block. So it took some time to just find my place here, find my footing, especially since we'd gone through such a, a you know, a culture shift in another way, in the sense that uh, we were being pulled into this sort of entertainment world that I'd, I'd been on the periphery of as a writer, but never a part of as far as production and through the lens of, of my son. Uh, but one thing that it really did do is it reminded me how much Los Angeles is not a single city uh, by any means. It's, it's a patchwork of many different cities. And the more time we spent here, and again, it's been seven years now, the more the texture and the historic, uh, the historic color of Los Angeles became apparent to me. And the history of our communities here is so deeply interwoven, yet also at the same time, I mean, how do I put it? Like segregated, right? Uh, that unpacking it is, is really fascinating. You know, Asian Americans have uh, been in, in the greater Los Angeles area for many generations. Uh, Japanese Americans, Chinese Americans were among the, the earliest to, uh, set, you know, to be settled here. Uh, there were Chinese Americans who came down south from uh, having essentially uh, arrived in America first to work in in the mining towns, right in the uh, uh, you know the gold rush era, and Los Angeles was uh, you know kind of the next metropolis which they could gravitate towards when that boom was over. Um, Japanese Americans actually first came to California. Uh, as part of larger scale agricultural efforts, right? Uh, just to, again, a pointer as to how all of our worlds are a little bit interconnected. The, uh, the biggest reason why Japanese Americans and Chinese Americans came in such large numbers to America was the end of slavery, right? All of a sudden there was this huge desire for cheap labor and they turned east and they turned south. <laughs> so, uh, you know, Mexican labor, uh, Chinese labor, Japanese labor became, and Filipino labor became uh, the primary sources for building, especially the West of America, right, the frontier, and um, and Filipinos as well. I mean, the Philippines is is kind of an interesting, uh, a particularly interesting kind of intersection between the worlds of uh, the Latin world and the the Asian world, as it were. Right, uh, right around you know the same time in which uh, Spain was colonizing North America, it was also you know planting uh, its flag in Asia in <laughs> in the Philippines and turning it into a major uh, entreport, right, a place where uh, the galleon trade would would go through to take trade spice trade from you know Asia, uh, you know kind of interchange it to different ships and then. Put it out throughout the world, throughout the new world, et cetera. So, uh, or the old world, and you know, et cetera. So, there's a there's a lot of uh, different routes by which Asians came here to uh, Southern California and to Los Angeles. But given what's been going on in recent months, I mean, we've obviously been seeing a very <laughs> 
a tough time for our communities. Uh, all of our communities, but Asian Americans have in particular felt uh, perhaps more specifically um, put under the, the, uh, the scope over the last year or so than we have in, in generations perhaps. And that's because of the heightened tenor of anti-Asian you know, uh, bias, the, the really sort of ugly rhetoric that's been used around COVID and the results being of course, uh, acts of violence and assault against Asian Americans culminating most recently in, in the shootings in, in Atlanta just last week. So one of the, the first things I really wanna talk about is 1871 and 1871, uh, marked the um, the year of the worst lynching, the worst mass lynching in American history. And obviously lynching took place across the South. It took place in the Midwest. Uh, a- African-Americans were of course the largest group to be targeted. Uh, but here in Los Angeles, there was a small community of Chinese Americans, again, people who migrated here from uh, the mining trade, set up their own small establishments. Uh, and that sort of mini Chinatown actually uh, was on a street that no longer exists anymore. It, it's now Los Angeles Street, basically, uh, which was called Calle de los Negros, right? Uh, so, you know, it had a, it had a, a nickname uh, that we won't repeat, but it was you know, N Alley, right? (laughs) Uh, Well, that was the Chinatown of 1871. And after there was an altercation in which a, um, a white man was, uh, was involved in, you know, basically a fight with a a Chinese man uh, that went badly, a mob of over 500 uh, white, uh, you know, ranchers and townspeople essentially stormed Calle de los Negros and uh, murdered and hung uh, 17 residents of that strip, all Chinese men. Uh, They robbed them, they burned their their homes, and uh, they even went so far as to remove gold teeth and to cut off fingers to to get the rings off their hands. And of course, none of those people actually got in any way um, charged or or, uh, sentenced to any time for their crime. that actually happened not very far from me, and I think much closer to you, if I recall where you are. Yeah, yeah, we're, we're located right there, uh, right across the street from Olvera Street, which actually was like the, the, the third uh, settlement uh, when, the, when the, the pobladores, the settlers came to and founded the city of LA. But it, it had been, that entire area was a central point for, for migration. Uh, Italians, like I said, uh, the, the, the Mexicans, uh, the and the, the, the Asian. And, and, uh, and part of the, the challenge uh, of, uh, of wrapping our heads around it is that the Asian community is so diverse. Uh, as you said, the Chinese were one of the first uh, to, to settle in this area, uh, Japanese around the same time, Filipinos. So, so that's part of it. But, but as you stated, you know, as, as a, with that example, you, you see the, 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 the attitudes, the the really uh, uh, of the, the the Anglo's for all intents and purposes, that they had against uh, a, an Asian community, uh, an other, somebody that was other than them. Yeah, and I think that's one of the things which, uh, frankly, uh, conversations like this highlight that we do come from very similar places in terms of how we have been seen historically, uh, how we've been treated historically, and. You know, even if our journeys have gone through very different paths since then, the roots of of um, the roots of America are anchored in you know uh, white supremacy and white white normative identities, right? So, uh, as much as America has always been a place that has claimed to be welcoming of people from the outside, that is always very much a uh, kind of a transactional welcoming and sometimes a very temporary welcoming. So, you know, it, it's something which looking back at this history, uh, you know, it, it, the, the massacre was, was kind of one big uh, anchoring point. But if you look at virtually every community, every uh, Asian ethnic enclave 
in the earliest part of Los Angeles's history, every single one of them has essentially been forcibly moved, right, to another place somewhere else in Los Angeles when it grew too large or encroached on neighborhoods that were, you know, still then, of course, predominantly white. There was a, a push to remove and relocate each of these communities. And I know this is something that's also occurred to black communities and to, uh, to Mexican communities in this area, but you know, it's, it's pretty astounding because uh, everything you see on the map right now, if you look at Koreatown, Koreatown actually, I mean, you know, we think of it as pretty well established where it is right now, uh, but Koreatown is actually in an area that is predominantly uh, Latin, Latin, Latino, right? Um, I think, you know, mostly Mexican, but also other, you know, Central American uh, Im immigrants have uh, resided in that area for a long time. And Koreatown was actually moved into that neighborhood because it originally was about 20 blocks lower south, uh, but was moved up above, uh, above Olympic basically because, you know, as the Korean American community there started to grow, the neighboring white communities complained and basically said, we don't want you here, go up there. <laughs> so you, you have that story repeating pretty frequently as you look at each of these different uh, immigrant communities. Like around what, what time, uh, you know, time frame did that occur? Uh, I think that's, uh, I believe that was in the 1900s, but uh, I'll have to look that up actually. Okay. Yeah. Um, then also, uh, you know, uh, the little Tokyo area that where, where, where mm. it's at, that wasn't the original place where, where the Japanese community first, uh, first gathered. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, Japanese actually settled in different places in Los Angeles. Uh, there are historical Japanese communities. Uh, certainly, you know, there was one in the Sautel region. There's one in uh, Gardena, uh, you know, lots of places across the map. But Little Tokyo did um, become kind of a magnet for Japanese Americans. But what happened was when the war came and Japanese Americans were relocated, right, uh, as they as the government phrased it, I mean, incarcerated <laughs> en masse, Little Tokyo was Little Tokyo no longer. It basically uh, removed Japanese Americans from their residences and businesses and other communities, you know, moved in because these were empty stores and empty homes. And actually uh, there was a, a, I think, uh, a pretty big Mexican community, but also a pretty big Filipino community that moved in uh, into the sort of emptied out neighborhood. And what's kind of interesting is that um, in 1943, I believe, you know, you had this uh, event, the, uh, the sort of the Zoot Suit Riots, right? Uh, well, you know, that was actually a, uh, a, a broad-based, you know, series of kind of assaults, like mob violence and so on and so forth, targeting the Mexican community, but also the Filipino community. I believe actually the first incident that led to the riots was in fact actually an altercation between uh, sailors, like U.S. Navy sailors, and a Filipino uh, worker who was out in the town at the time. So, again, these are communities that that have been pretty interconnected in a lot of ways. No, you're exactly right. In the community where I grew up, uh, uh, in the Harbor area, Wilmington, uh, mm. back when in my uh, childhood into my my uh, late twenties, thirties, whatever. Uh, but in high school, it was very diverse at the time. Uh, with uh, with a, a small but, but significant Asian uh, uh, student body, including uh, Japanese, uh, mm. uh, the the force of relocation from from Terminal Island was mm. a factor. Uh, yes, the, we had, uh, and then we saw the 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 migration of uh, of Samoan, the Samoan community in mm. the Carson area, uh, Wilmington, mm. Dominguez Hills area, and uh, so yeah, the but then. It seems like pockets grow, uh, even mm. within the, the Chinese community. We have, of course, Chinatown, the traditional one that we know of, which is more of a commercial area, as mm -hmm. well as residential. But what led to the, uh, at least uh, uh, to their relocation to more the San Gabriel Valley in that area? Mm. So that's interesting, because that was actually a, a voluntary migration. Uh, and I do want to talk about that. But you mentioned Terminal Island. And I got to talk about that, because that was just like an amazing, amazing uh, a, a sort of uh, organic emergence of a community there, right? Uh, I, I think, you know, most people who are listening probably don't know this, uh, but Terminal Island is uh, 
is a man-made island. It like it didn't exist. It was actually created essentially in the port of Los Angeles as just this place for boats to dock. But Japanese American fishermen, right, gravitated to the area and began kind of building shacks on there because you know they were fishing anyway. So they thought, well, let's live close to our boats. So a community uh, sprang up in in on Terminal Island. This sort of like you know featureless man-made island that was uh, Japanese American and that had lasted long enough and it was sort of big enough that it actually developed its own kind of unique dialect of language, right? Sort of a pidgin that mixed Japanese and English. A lot of them were from the same sort of place uh, in Japan. So over time, like over multiple generations, they kind of became uh, a community that has all, almost its own language, right? And it was pretty insular, but the crazy, the amazing thing is that they managed to survive and thrive because on Terminal Island, those Japanese American fishermen managed to figure out this way of fishing that no one else knew how to do. It was like this secret that only the Terminal Island Japanese fishermen knew how to do, right? And it was so successful beating out everybody else who was fishing that they started actually building canneries on Terminal Island because the Japanese American fishermen were bringing in so much fish. So it's just like a, just this wild piece of history. And the reason why it's so interesting is because actually uh, last fall, uh, AMC, which has this horror anthology called The Terror, right? It actually set the second season of The Terror, that, that horror anthology on Terminal Island. It was called Term, uh, the, the Terror Infamy. And it was basically a ghost story set on, on uh, Terminal Island against the backdrop of incarceration. And I mean, it was an incredible, incredible uh, piece of work, uh, just mesmerizing, tragic and horrifying all at once. But it, it was just a sort of weird little thing that led me to just research the history of Terminal Island. That's the only reason I, I wanted to, to share it. Oh, well, well, thank you for that. And that's why we brought you on, Jeff, because you're, you're sharing things that, that, that we may or may not know uh, I, I didn't know that. And my, my, uh, my grandmother and my father for a time, but my grandmother uh, retired from the canneries uh, working there at Starkist. Wow. Uh, my, uh, my, uh, my wife's uh, grandma uh, as well uh, from, the, from the chicken of the sea. So the, it's a, there was a, a place of, of uh, as you say, the canneries were the lifeblood for, for many families mm -hmm. in the town that I grew up in. And uh, now they're, they're gone, you know, taken over by, uh, by the government uh, or, or mm. shipping containers. But, uh, but you know, again, uh, uh, there was that interconnectedness between the, the, that community and the, the Mexican community of, of my hometown, Wilmington, which is, uh, uh, you know, I, I remember and um, which is part of our history. That is amazing. Uh, yeah. I mean, it's it's little it's little uh, sort of clusters of uh, of historical insight like that that show the ways in which uh, the way communities evolve and intersect. I, I, you know, so much of it is planned, and so much of it is not. Right, our ancestors come here for a specific reason, but when we get when when they arrived here more often than not, they didn't find what they were looking for exactly. So they had to adapt. And it's in that adaptation that they migrated or they invented new things or they you know, created new ways of surviving and living. And more often than not, it actually caused uh, our communities to have to find new ways to collaborate with one another as well. Um, so, you know, uh, I think about this from the vantage point, especially of labor, right? I mean, uh, if you look at... Uh, California labor in general, uh, most of the successes of uh, the labor movement in California were actually uh, based on agricultural workers, you know, who were led, of course, uh, by Mexican leaders like Cesar Chavez and Filipino leaders like uh, Larry Itliong, right? Uh, so that kind of like side by side collaboration that, you know, sort of in the trenches partnership was something that we, you know, really don't raise up in our history enough, but it's important because it shows the fact that we didn't just live side by side. We lived with one another, literally. So. All right. Well, good. you know, and you talk about the, 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 the voluntary movement as well. 
Uh, yes. But again, the, the, the Japanese community in, in Terminal Island, that wasn't a, a movement. Moving out of Terminal Island wasn't, wasn't voluntary. So that was not what voluntary. Ended up, what, ended, what, <laughs> what ended up happening there? Um, well, I mean, you know, they were relocated uh, to the camps, right? Uh, afterwards, when they wanted to come back, there was nothing left for them. Uh, basically, the government had, base, had, had, you know, torn down all of their homes, uh, the canneries, and the, the entire industry had started to fade. Port of Los Angeles became, was becoming a very different, um, a very different economic beast. Uh, but, you know, that's true for so many Japanese Americans who came back after the war. Uh, they had built, you know, farms, they had built homes, they had constructed businesses. And so many people came back and, and had nothing or had very little. Uh, the ones who were able to actually salvage things, they did so because they found people, you know, white friends, for instance, who were willing to hold on to property in their name because it was otherwise going to be confiscated and who were good enough to actually return it after the fact. So uh, it's, it, it is one of the sort of great in economic impacts on our Asian American community that really has never been quite fully addressed or redressed, even with redress for in, in, incarceration. Uh, but you also mentioned, you know, San Gabriel Valley, and that was, of course, a very voluntary migration. <laughs> and it, the story of that is, is fascinating because uh, we see San Gabriel now, it's this sort of suburban string of impeccable little townships. Uh, they were all sort of historically white neighborhoods. Uh, I think in the 1980s, most of these townships we now point to as, uh, as kind of suburban Chinatowns, right? Like Rosemead and San Marino and Temple City, et cetera. They had, they were like 93, 94, 95% white. But what happened was that uh, in the early part, of, well, the late, late 70s and the early part of the 80s, there was this enterprising developer named Frederick Shea, right? And Frederick Shea uh, was, you know, basically pretty immersed in, uh, in, in his community to the point where he realized that in the late 70s, more and more Asians were coming to this country who were kind of coming from a different socioeconomic status. Uh, after 1965, when restrictive quotas were taken away, right? Basically, before 1965, only a tiny handful of people from Asian countries, the, the sort of Asian restricted zone, right, uh, were allowed to come to America. But after 65, uh, the, I wouldn't say the floodgates were open, but Asian uh, immigrants were being welcomed because after the, the multiple wars, there was a real need for brain power, for medical professionals, uh, for technical people, engineers, et cetera. So people who had specific professional backgrounds and uh, human capital were actively being invited to come. And so a, a lot of educated Asians uh, were coming from new places. And in particular, uh, Chinese migration had moved away from mainland China because mainland China was you know, now under control of the Chinese Communist Party who was not letting anybody out of the country. Uh, most of it was instead coming from Hong Kong and Taiwan. And Hong Kong was of course under British rule and Taiwan was its own thing. And in both cases, uh, there were a, a growing class of individuals who were coming uh, with college degrees and wanting to migrate to America. And so this guy, Fred Shea was like, huh, these guys are, are immigrants, but they're not immigrants who are coming in you know, farming or doing blue collar work, they may still want to live together. What if I actually created a community that was targeted at these people? And so he, he looked around and he realized Monterey Park, right, has as an area code 818. Now, this is important because anybody who knows uh, Chinese traditional culture, uh, there's a, a lot of superstitions around numbers. And one of them is that eight is a lucky number. And 818 in particular sort of suggests like, you know, come here and you will, you will make your fortune, right? So he began putting together, buying up sort of development tracks, like just empty land and building suburban houses and then actively marketing them to Taiwan and Hong Kong, 
literally calling it the 818 and saying, oh, come here, find your fortune. It's basically, you know, uh, this is this is the new gold mountain. <laughs> it's, it's like, this is, this is the place where you can actually uh, prosper in America. And it was hugely successful. And Monterey Park went from being, you know, 90 something percent uh, white to being majority Asian. And of that plurality, Taiwanese American, by the early 1980s. So uh, that was the, the, the sort of initial anchor for Asian American communities at the opening mouth, if you will, of the San Gabriel Valley. And even the, though the rest of the San Gabriel Valley is not in the 818, <laughs> it, it nevertheless uh, sort of propagated. More and more Asian Americans began finding towns which had good education, nice housing stock, et cetera, and then moving into those areas. So this large and relatively affluent, in some cases spectacularly affluent, if you look at places like San Marino, uh, set of, of Asian American suburbs began popping up. And it's fascinating because this had never really happened before in, in some ways in the history of America. So, you know, it, people have been doing a lot of research and conversation around this whole idea of the quote unquote ethnoburb, right? The, uh, the suburban Chinatown. Uh, I'll pause here. I have tons more I could say about this subject. But <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, and, and there is, and, and we appreciate that. But then, the, but then we have another flashpoint of uh, of you know the other the other side of of uh, of of what happens in this case, what happens to to Asians mm. in, uh, in in LA, and that was in the, in the early nineties. Well, yeah. Um, so. One of the things that we have seen is that Asian communities uh, have frequently been, uh, you know, whether you're talking about Chinese or Japanese or in this case, Korean, right? Uh, have, have frequently been put in situations where uh, they're sort of the middlemen minorities, right? Uh, if you look at Chinese communities around the world, a lot of Chinese, uh, of the Chinese diaspora is you know, running retail, small businesses, uh, groceries, and so on and so forth. And uh, that's because essentially it's almost like ethnic franchising, right? There's this network of connections that people have where if you open up a restaurant or if you open up a, uh, a deli or something, uh, you can actually you know, draw from the contacts and experience of all these other people who've done it before you. In fact, most people actually come to this, you know, come to America as immigrants with the promise of, you know, essentially working for uh, somebody else's business. You know, a, a business owner, a restaurant owner might bring over uh, immigrants and sponsor them with the promise that, hey, you work for me, pay off the amount I spent to actually sponsor you, and then I'll invest money in you. I'll actually give you money to go start your own, whatever this business is, somewhere very far away and not competitive to me. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that, that whole notion of sort of like this ethnic franchising is part of the reason why you see, uh, you know, Chinese takeout restaurants all across America. It's the reason why you see uh, in New York, Korean nail salons here in, Viet in, in um, Los Angeles, it's Vietnamese nail salons, uh, Cambodian donut shops, right? Uh, these are all because these infrastructures of uh, prior immigrants building a path, you know, sort of creating these milestones for other people to follow, and then actually actively bringing other immigrants down that journey has, has led to this sort of proliferation of people in these specific industries. Well, Koreatown uh, and Korean American merchants in general uh, follow the same path, right? So you see, a lot of Korean Americans have opened restaurants and liquor stores uh, and uh, other small business establishments. And they have generally opened these restaurants and liquor stores and other establishments in places where white merchants kind of didn't want to serve those neighborhoods, right? Uh, these were underserved communities which did not have access to a, a lot of the services that, you know, one might expect essentially, uh, like being able to go down to the corner and just buy a package of cigarettes. So 
you know, the bodegas uh, in in New York uh, uh, are mostly, uh, you know, I, where I'm from, right? Are mostly Latin owned. Here in uh, in LA, you know, obviously there's a lot of of uh, different communities participating in retail, but in Koreatown in particular, and in in the areas around Koreatown, like South Central, you had a lot of Korean merchants, Korean small business owners who were filling that role. But the problem is that when you come to this country, and in many cases, Korean Americans in particular, uh, coming after the war and or in the generations after the war, they were coming also from a country where they were displaced, where in many cases, they gained a level of education. You know, they were doctors or trained to be engineers, but none of that was at all useful when they came to America because they couldn't speak English and they none of their certifications were useful in America. Um, many of them had no choice but to go into businesses like owning liquor stores, right, to, to feed their families. So that's all kind of backdrop, right? The, the main reason I, I talk about all that is because it sets up a situation where you have uh, an immigrant community that is a little bit uh, separate, it is very separated from the customers that it's actually serving. Uh, they are culturally and linguistically in many cases separated. And you have incidents in which there's kind of mutual distrust and suspicion. You have incidents where some, sometimes that erupts into, into violence or other kinds of, of altercations. Uh, and the most prominent ones occurred in the late 80s and early 1990s in like Flatbush and in Los Angeles, uh, there was a Korean American woman grocer named uh, Sun Ja Du, right? Who um, basically uh, shot a uh, African American girl uh, who was unarmed and not threatening. And even if she had been armed and threatening, it's like, there's nothing about this which is acceptable, right? But she, she shot this girl, Latasha Harlins, and it was a, it was, it was like uh, a grenade had gone off in the already tense relationship, in the already tense front line, if you will, between Korean immigrant uh, store owners in and around South Central, in and around, you know, Black communities. Uh, and all of that was already kind of bubbling before 1992 when the Rodney King verdict was announced. So, you know, all this, this tension had been building up, but when Rodney King was just viciously beaten by white police officers and those police officers were let off, you know, with, with no, uh, with no t jail time and, basically no punishment. <laughs> um, the black community rose up in, I think, very, very justified rage. But the problem is that the path for that rage went directly through the Korean immigrant community of Koreatown. Uh, the police fell back and basically protected you know, West Hollywood and Beverly Hills, kind of created this final line of defense to block off uh, the uprising of, of Black Americans uh, from going into white neighborhoods. And meanwhile, Koreatown was basically abandoned. So the amount of damage that was wrought in the community was in the uh, tens and tens of billions. Uh, there were lives lost, there were livelihoods destroyed. And it, it, to this day, it's something which I think Korean Americans cannot and will not forget, even if they didn't actually, if they were tiny kids when, when that was happening. Uh, it's actually called Saigu, right? You know, uh, for uh, the date on which it occurred. Uh, it's just like 9-11, if you say Saigu to a Korean American, they know exactly what you're talking about. And, but but uh, though it happened primarily in Koreatown here in LA, uh, now we have a, a different uh, connotation when we think about Koreatown. Uh, it's a, it's a, a happening place. It's a, yeah. it's a gathering place. Uh, uh, well, prior to to March of 2020, anyway. Uh, <laughs> so, so how did that come about? 
So the, the amazing thing is when Koreatown was forced to move north, right, into the largely Latino neighborhood that it ended up actually growing it up and around, um, it, it actually ended up in a, a new zoning area. Uh, it was an area which had an older housing stock, mostly empty or a lot of it empty, right? The, the reason why Korean Americans were just, you know, chose to move up there and, and build their businesses there was because there was a lot of uh, open storefronts that had been emptied out. And so they took over those storefronts, they rented them uh, out. And because of the arcane way in which these things work, uh, Koreatown actually uh, ended up, the new Koreatown, if you will, ended up being in an area which was one of the few grandfathered places for essentially 24 hour uh, (laughs) establishments, right? And uh, also as a result, you, you know, a lot of these places were like old school uh, taverns and saloons and stuff like that, that were were being rebuilt into restaurants and lounges and, and bars. And, you know, all these, these places basically had either uh, ready access to liquor licenses or even cabaret licenses in some cases. Uh, but because the neighborhood, again, you know, unlike the neighborhood where the first Koreatown was, which was, you know, adjacent to white residential neighborhoods, this was a commercial area. It was a commercial area that was an old neighborhood with uh, less of a uh, residential footprint anywhere around it. it. It became an obvious opportunity in some ways uh, to create a, a nightlife sort of demi capital, right? Uh, and Koreatown among Asian Americans and actually kind of among Los Angelinos in general is now just like this you know, it's a destination place. It, it, it's, it's a place where it doesn't matter what time of night or time of morning you want to go, you can head to Koreatown and have a blast or have a feast or, uh, you know, have a nightcap or a hangover remedy. <laughs> <laughs> or a combination of, of the, For all of those the, in one night. Plus a, a little karaoke. <laughs> Uh, yes, and the karaoke, I, I will say uh, Noribang, right, which is the uh, Korean version of karaoke, the, my, in my view, preferable version of karaoke, which actually is rooms, right? You rent a room, you hang out with your friends, you don't have to be in front of like 80 people in a bar, you, you have your own little private audience. Well, Noribang is one of the things that was the, one of the first casualties of, of coronavirus, right? And I, I, I swear, I hope it comes back because it's still... It is the thing that I live for <laughs> on certain I, weekend I, nights. I, I could attest to that. <laughs> got a little, little talent there. Oh, I forgot. <laughs> yes, that is true. <laughs> All right. well, 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 then that brings us to, to this next uh, chapter, if you will, of, uh, hmm. of, uh, of this really focus on, on Asians, but in a negative way. Yeah. Well, you know, so one of the things which I think is... Um, true if you look back at the history of any of our communities it's that a lot of the narratives that are constructed around us are not ever new they're recycled right the images the stereotypes the ways that we're framed by by america are often they're often stories that were told by and about prior generations and in many cases about by and about other other communities so for asian americans the story that has always been told is the story of being alien, of being outsiders. And that's because we were treated like aliens and outsiders for many, many decades. Uh, and, and you know, as we've found out, we still are sometimes. The Chinese Exclusion Act was the very first uh, immigration, the, or exclusion acts, I should say, right? Were the very first sets of policies that were designed to specifically target one ethnicity. Uh, There were the first real restrictions for that matter against immigration to America. America had basically open borders until government, the federal government decided to start restricting Chinese. And so uh, that perception of Chinese as as being outsiders who could be excluded, uh, of, of being aliens who are unassimilable is something that we have seen just progressively following us through the decades. Add to that the fact that 
America has been at war with Asian countries for much of its modern existence, right? From World War II to the Korean War to Vietnam War. And then, uh, you know, after that kind of economic war with Japan and with China. So there's been fertile ground to take old stereotypes and resurrect them and reuse them. When, when you saw actually the arrival of not even COVID, but the, the first uh, the first big pandemic that all of us were kind of unprepared for in the modern era in in the twenty you know twentieth century was SARS, right? And um, SARS was actually coronavirus one. It was the first time coronavirus kind of went pandemic, but it was virulent enough and dangerous enough that it led to you know, dozens of deaths. There were outbreaks of it in North America as well. People were terrified. And Asian ethnic enclaves across America and across North America and in Canada as well were essentially just were redlined, right? I mean, you know, people, uh, they, were, they were emptied out. They became like ghost towns. People wouldn't go in or out. And the, the first wave of, of, you know, whispers about uh, Asians being carriers of disease really was brought forward into this era by SARS. I, I might note that the association of especially Chinese with disease was something that stretched all the way back to the very beginning of immigration uh, because uh, it was actually San Francisco Chinatown was, uh, was again, essentially a community that received no resources. There was no sanitation. It was kind of just closed off from the rest of the world. And as a result, it became a, a particularly uh, fertile place for rats. And as a result, there was a, an outbreak actually of the bubonic plague in, in San Francisco Chinatown. And that famously allowed a lot of the nativists to, uh, to call Chinese basically an infestation, you know, people who are bringing disease into America. So that language res was resurrected by SARS. It was resurrected resurrect again when the bird flu, you know, the avian flu uh, was outbreaking. And then came COVID. And the difference, I think, between those episodes and COVID is that we had a president in place who purposely was using rhetoric to heighten antagonism, uh, hatred, suspicion, and fear within Americans, within his supporters against Chinese people. And of course, that meant all Asians, because most of his supporters could not tell the difference. So that is where we are today. And we continue to see the, the implications of it today. And, and uh, of course, we saw the, the, the I, don't, I wouldn't say culmination, but just the, uh, a very violent up, uh, uh, expression of this, even though they're still uh, in the investigation phase, whether or not it was a I hate crime specifically towards Asians. You know, this happens in, in Atlanta, uh, you know, a couple of weeks back. And, uh, but have you seen, you know, we're seeing at least I, I, in the media, uh, TV, what I'm reading online and so on, there seems to be a, a, a cohesion amongst the, the Asian community in fighting back. Uh, could you tell us about what you're, what you're seeing and uh, in, in these kind of efforts? So I think one of the things that's really shifted uh, just literally over the last couple of years is that Asian Americans have kind of found our voice. And it's, it's a little strange to say so, but I, I think no small part of it has come from the fact that we have started to see ourselves. I mean, really see ourselves reflected. That's been empowering. And that has come out of Hollywood you know, as much as anywhere else, fresh off the boat, crazy rich Asians, uh, you know, always be my maybe, you know, to all the boys I love you for there were those sort of spate of Asian American works that were extremely successful that brought a lot of attention to the community. And that really in, just empowered Asian Americans felt who felt for the first time, like we were being seen, right, and we were seeing ourselves. That all happened literally months before all the walls started crashing down, right? I mean, you know, literally 2019, we're celebrating what we called Asian August, right? And then uh, just a year later, 
we were we were facing the beginnings, the very earliest beginnings of the coronavirus epidemic, of the COVID epidemic. I, I think though that if we had not had that, we'd be in a much darker place now. That we had that moment of empowerment and celebration actually gave us a little bit more of an emotional resource to be able to deal with and confront some of the things we're facing now. It also actually activated a lot of our voices. Like there were celebrities all of a sudden who, I don't wanna misframe this perhaps, but there are a lot of people who, who point out that uh, <laughs> there are some Latter-day Asians, people who have really kind of found their voices as Asian Americans and started to stand up and speak on behalf of the community and more power to them, right? Uh, but I think they wouldn't have felt that power to do so had they not seen that being Asian American wasn't quite so bad anymore, right? So there's all that. Uh, the other thing is that the internet has enabled Asian Americans to really punch above our weight in terms of representation. Uh, I think what you're seeing is that especially younger Asian Americans have really taken the internet and turned it into a very potent platform. Uh, you know, from social media, all the way from uh, old school stuff like Facebook and Twitter, all the way through TikTok, right? You see a disproportionate number of, of young Asian Americans who are standing up and being active, not just to start memes uh, and, and, you know, kind of viral stuff, but to actually speak out for social justice. Uh, so that's been an incredible phenomenon. And I think that it really has in a lot of ways helped us get to where we are now, help us get through where we are now. And so that's a, a clear example of, of representation matters, you know, both in the, the Asian community uh, in the, the Latino community and the African-American community as well. Uh, yes. Seeing your, see yourself on the screen, people that, that uh, may look like you, that have the, the same values, uh, that, that share cultures, it, it really does bring, uh, you know that recognition and and uh, and empowerment. So uh, that's what we're seeing now. So 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 how can you know uh, non Asians? Uh, how can we ally with with the community? What what can we do during these really perilous times where we're seeing these tragedies in Atlanta, but also every day we're hearing of 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 elderly uh, Asians being uh, assaulted on the streets. Uh, you know. The, that president that you speak of still hasn't uh, uh, apologized for for the, the 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 terror that he's brought on to the to the community. Um, what, what can we do? I mean, honestly, things like this, right? I think we need to be talking to each other. I think we need to be seeing each other. Uh, I think I'm seeing more and more that people are recognizing that. In the friend, I have a friend, uh, Fred Joseph, who wrote a book recently called The Black Friend, actually. Uh, and in it, he raises this, um, he raises this set of paradigms. You know, people talk about allies. Allies are good. We want allies. But in some ways, what we really want is accomplices. <laughs> we want to, we want to actually conspire together. We want to build things together. And we want to make a future together. And I think that starts with interactions uh, that aren't just about intervening when there is something going wrong, although that's critically important. And I, I urge anybody watching and listening to, to do just that, uh, to do so safely, to do so loudly, to do so as part of hopefully a group. But also when we aren't in danger, when we're not threatened, we need to be finding time to talk and to build and to conspire. That's, I think, where the future really lies. And here in Los Angeles, one of the most diverse and multicultural, multi-ethnic, multilingual places on earth, that opportunity exists in greater degree than virtually anywhere. So let's make that happen. All right. And we're, we're making it happen here on En Casa Con La Plaza. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jeff. And, and part of it, of, of course, is, is sharing our stories. Uh, and and you're good. you have something uh, coming up pretty soon that, that, uh, that will help us to learn about uh, history uh, here. And I'm gonna just put up this, uh, this screenshot here. If you could tell us about this project that you're working on. Yeah, so this is something which, uh, it's, it's, our, it's our COVID project, right? People are always like, oh, Shakespeare wrote King Lear during uh, <laughs> the plague years. So if you, if you were in quarantine, do you have an excuse for not coming up with some, uh, some good way to 
uh, tell a story, a new different kind of story. And what I and Phil Yu and Philip Wong have done uh, is we've been talking for a long time that there's this kind of a blank space, right, from the 1980s till today, uh, 30 years in which people really have not documented all the blood, sweat, toil, and tears that Asian Americans have invested to get us to, you know, uh, to a point of visibility of representation. So we put together a proposal and, and pitched and sold a book called Rise, a pop history of Asian America from the 90s to now. Uh, that book is going to be coming out in the fall from Houghton Mifflin Harcourt. And uh, yeah, if uh, keep an eye out for it. When it comes out, it should be pretty cool, pretty fun. Uh, we've been having a blast writing it, as exhausting as it's been. And we hope to get the chance to come back and talk more about it. Oh, well, most definitely, Jeff. And, uh, and tell us what else you got going on. Uh, you know, well, uh, <laughs> I'm uh, just trying to hold it down, you know, at home. <laughs> I've got two kids. We're trying to, trying to make sure they actually uh, pay attention to school and, and not Minecraft. Uh, that's, that's most of what I'm, I'm working on. Well, you're, but, you're yeah. doing a little bit of writing too. Uh, most recently, CNN uh, oh, yeah. opinions. Uh, you, you talk about a $300 million investment that would mean yeah. everything to my community. You got to yes. just, just uh, Google Jeff Yang and you'll get a, a, <laughs> a, a boatload of, uh, of great writing, great insights that you share, not only with, uh, you know, through the public, but also to decision makers. And, and that's, mm-hmm. that's part of the, I think, your, your strategy in making this change happen is, is, uh, is being a, a voice uh, of not just, uh, you know, letting that, this information, but it's also bottom up. You're seeing what's oh, going yeah. on in the community and you're bubbling up to these decision makers so they could make the, the right decision. And that's where I, I'm so happy to have met you, Jeff, uh, all those years ago at, at uh, that company that we worked with for a while <laughs> in which we, we, we did that, exactly that. So uh, exactly. So we, we, uh, if any questions out there, go ahead and use the chat. But for we, we have Christine Jones here on, on uh, Zoom saying, good discussion. Would like to bring programs like this to my alley suburb of La Crescenta. Well, you could share, we'll be, uh, we're taping this, recording it, we'll be putting it on YouTube on our Facebook page and at La Plaza LA's uh, website uh, and share that with your friends, uh, Christine. Uh, Catherine Lugit, thank you so much. Uh, on Facebook, we have uh, Isabel Rojas, a good friend of La Plaza. She's saying this Friday on the 26th at 4 p.m. a march from San Gabriel City Hall to Alhambra. City uh-huh. Hall in support of our AAPI brothers and sisters, we need to unite and stop the hate. Thank you for that, Isabel. Mm-hmm. Uh, Sean Galbraith, thank you for this wonderful discussion. Christine Anguiano, Conspire. And from uh, Gardena in the South Bay, Donna Moreno sends her, her saludos. So, so thank you, uh, Bernice Gallegos from Whittier. All of you who, who reached out, who, who tuned in tonight for En Casa con la Plaza, thank you so much. And thank you so much, Jeff, for thank sharing you. with us. And, and yeah, we will get you back on when you, when you publish that book and you send me, uh, send me my signed copy. <laughs> absolutely all right okay well um thank you all for for tuning in thank you to our sponsors kaiser permanente and uh pepsico and uh coming up on in casa con la plaza uh this friday this weekend of course is the weekend that we celebrate uh cesar chavez who, who jeff spoke of uh who who really got his start along with those filipino farm workers uh there in the delano area but we have oscar castillo a uh, photographer from the 60s and 70s who documented uh, Cesar's uh, forays into urban areas where he was organizing and spreading the word about the work of the United Farm Workers. So that's this Friday, March 26th at 7 p.m. And then next Wednesday, we have uh, Paul Chavez, the president of the Cesar Chavez Foundation, who will be uh, talking about how that foundation is continuing the life work of Cesar Chavez, not just with the farm workers, but through its various foundations, um, housing, uh, employment, uh, civil rights, what they're doing. So that's next Wednesday, March 31st. You can find all this information and all of our upcoming events, uh, sessions here on En Casa. And then great news, we're gonna be opening soon. The museum will be opening. Um, we'll be making a big announcement uh, real shortly, but, but please tune in and we hope to see you at La Plaza real soon. So uh, again, muchas gracias, Jeff Yang. 
Thank you so much. Best, best to your family. And uh, we'll see you soon. Good night. Absolutely. Good night.